Sermon 1, Salvation by Faith, preached at St. Mary's, Oxford, before the university on June 18, 1738. By grace are you saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8. All the blessings which God hath bestowed upon man are of his mere grace, bounty, or favor. His free, undeserved favor. Favor altogether undeserved, man having no claim to the least of his mercies. It was free grace that formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into him a living soul and stamped on that soul the image of God and put all things under his feet. The same free grace continues to us at this day, life and breath in all things. For there is nothing we are or have or do which can deserve the least thing at God's hand. All our works thou, O God, hast wrought in us. These, therefore, are so many more instances of free mercy. And whatever righteousness may be found in man, this also is the gift of God. Wherewithal, then, shall a sinful man atone for any of the least of his works or his sins? With his own works? No. Were they ever so many or holy, they are not his own, but God's. But indeed, they are all unholy and sinful themselves, so that every one of them needs a fresh atonement. Only corrupt fruit grows on a corrupt tree, and his heart is altogether corrupt and abominable, being come short of the glory of God, the glorious righteousness at first impressed on his soul after the image of his great creator. Therefore, having nothing, neither righteousness nor works to plead, his mouth is utterly stopped before God. If then sinful men find favor with God, it is grace upon grace. If God vouchsafes still to pour fresh blessings upon us, yea, the greatest of all blessings, salvation, what can we say to these things but thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift? And thus it is. Herein God commandeth his love toward us, commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died to save us. By grace, then, are ye saved through faith. Grace is the source, faith the condition of salvation. Now that we fall not short of grace by God, it concerns us carefully to inquire, one, what faith it is through which we are saved, two, what is the salvation which is through faith, and three, how we may answer some objections. One, what faith it is through which we are saved. And first, it is not barely the faith of a heathen, Now God requireth of a heathen to believe that God is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and that he is to be sought by glorifying him as God, by giving him thanks for all things, and by a careful practice of moral virtue, of justice, mercy, and truth toward their fellow creatures. A Greek or Roman, therefore, yea, a Scythian or an Indian, was without excuse if he did not believe thus much. The being and attributes of God, a future state of reward and punishment, and the obligatory nature of moral virtue. For this is barely the faith of a heathen. Nor secondly is it the faith of a devil, though this goes much farther than that of a heathen. For a devil believes not only that there is a wise and powerful God, gracious to reward and just to punish, but also that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, the Savior of the world. So we find him declaring in expressed terms, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Nor can we doubt but that that unhappy spirit believes all those words which came out of the mouth of the Holy One, yea, and whatsoever else was written by those holy men of old, of two of whom he was compelled to give that most glorious testimony. These men are the servants of the Most High God, who show unto you the way of salvation." Thus much, then, the great enemy of God and man believes and trembles in believing that God was made manifest in the flesh, that he will tread all enemies under his feet, and that all scripture was given by the inspiration of God. Thus far goeth the faith of a devil. Thirdly, the faith through which we are saved, in that sense of the word which will hereafter be explained, is not barely that which the apostles themselves had while Christ was yet upon earth, though they so believed on him as to leave all and follow him, although they had then power to work miracles, to heal all manner of diseases and all manner of disease. Yea, they had then power and authority over all devils, and which is beyond this, they were sent by their master to preach the kingdom of God. What faith is it, then, 
through which we are saved? It may be, it may be answered first in general. It is the faith in Christ. Christ, therefore, sorry, Christ and God through Christ are the proper objects of it. Herein, therefore, it is sufficiently absolutely distinguished from the faith of either the ancient or modern heathens. And from the point of a devil, and from the faith of a devil, it is fully distinguished by this. It is not barely a speculative, rational thing, a cold, lifeless ascent, a train of ideas in the head, but also a disposition of the heart. For thus saith Scripture, With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe with thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And herein does it differ from the faith which the apostles themselves had while our Lord was on earth, that it acknowledges the necessity and merits of his death and the power of his resurrection. It acknowledges his death as the only sufficient means of redeeming man from death eternal and his resurrection as the restoration of us all to life in immortality. Inasmuch as he was delivered for our sins and rose again for our justification. Christian faith is then not only an assent to the whole gospel of Christ, but also a full reliance on the blood of Christ, a trust in the merits of his life, death, and resurrection a recumbency upon him as our atonement and our life as given for us and living in us, and in consequence hereof, a closing with him and cleaving to him as our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, or in one word, our salvation. 2. What salvation it is through which, uh, which is through this faith is the second thing to be considered. And first, whatsoever else it implies, it is, it is a present salvation. It is something attainable, yea, actually attained on earth by those who are partakers of this faith. For thus saith the apostle to the believers at Ephesus, and in them to the believers of all ages, not ye shall be, though this is also true, but ye are saved through faith. Ye are saved, to comprise all in one word, from sin. This is a salvation which is through faith. This is that great salvation foretold by the angel before God brought his first begotten into the world. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And neither here nor in any parts, other parts of the Holy Writ is there any limitation or restriction. All his people, or as it is elsewhere expressed, all that believe in him, he will save from all their sins, from original and actual, past and present sin of the flesh and of the spirit. Through faith that is in him, they are both saved both from the guilt and from the power of it. First, from the, power, from the guilt of all past sin. For whereas all the world is guilty before God, insomuch as he should be, that should he be extreme to mark what is unamiss, there is none that could abide it. And whereas by the law is only the knowledge of sin, but no deliverance from it, so that by fulfilling the deeds of the law, no flesh can be justified in his sight, now the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, is manifested unto all that believe. Now they that are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, him God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for or by the remission of the sins that are past. Now hath Christ taken away the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. He is... Um, he hath blotted out the handwriting that was against us, taking it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. There is, therefore, no condemnation now to them which believe in Christ Jesus. And being saved from guilt, they are saved from fear, not indeed from a filial fear of offending, but from all servile fear, from that fear which hath torment, from fear of punishment, from fear of the wrath of God, from whom they now no longer regard as a severe master, but as an indulgent father. They have not received again the spirit of bondage, but the spirit of adoption, whereby they cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself also bearing witness with their spirits that they are the children of God. They are also saved from the fear, though not from the possibility, of falling away from the grace of God and coming short of the great and precious promises. Thus have they peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. They rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and the love of God is shed abroad in their hearts through the Holy Ghost which is given unto them. And hereby they are persuaded, though perhaps not at all times, nor with the same fullness of persuasion, 
that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, through this faith, they are saved from the power of sin as well as from the guilt of it. So the apostle declares, Ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoever abideth in him sinneth not. Again, little children, let no man deceive you. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Whosoever believeth is born of God. And whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Once more, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that the wicked one toucheth him not. He that is by faith born of God sinneth not, one, by any habitual sin, for all habitual sin is sin reigning, but sin cannot reign in any that believeth, nor two, by any willful sin, for his will, while he abideth in the faith, is utterly set against all sin, and abhorreth it as a deadly poison. Nor three, by any sinful desire, for he continually desireth the holy and perfect will of God, and any tendency to an unholy desire, he, by the grace of God, stifleth in the birth. Nor four, does he sin by infirmities, whether in act, word, or thought, for his infirmities have no concurrence of his will, and without this they are not properly sins. Thus, he that is born of God doth, commit, doth not commit sin, and though he cannot say he hath not sinned, yet now he sinneth not. This then is a salvation which is through faith, even in the present world, a salvation from sin and the consequences of sin, both often expressed in the word justification, which taken the largest sense implies a deliverance from guilt and punishment by the atonement of Christ actually implied, applied to the soul of the sinner now believing on him, and a deliverance from the power of sin through Christ formed in his heart. So that he who is thus justified or saved by the faith is indeed born again. He is born again of the Spirit unto a new life, which is hid with Christ in God. And as a newborn babe, he gladly receives the adalon, sincere milk of the word, and grows thereby, going on in the might of the Lord his God, from faith to faith, from grace to grace, until at length he come into a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ." Three, the first usual objection to this is that to preach salvation or justification by faith only is to preach against holiness and good works, to which a short answer might be given. It would be so if we spake, as some do, of a faith which was separate from these, but we speak of a faith which is not so, but productive of all good works and all holiness. But it may be of use to consider it at a uh, it more at large, especially since it is no new objection, but as old as St. Paul's time. For even when it was asked, do we not make the law void through faith? We answer, first, all who, do not, who, all who preach not faith do manifestly make void the law, either directly and grossly, by limitations and comments that eat out all the spirit of the text, or indirectly, by not pointing out the only means whereby it is possible to perform it. Whereas, secondly, we establish the law, both by showing its full extent and spiritual meaning, and by calling all to that living way whereby the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in them. These, while they trust is the blood of Christ alone, use the ordinances which he hath appointed, do all the good works which he had before prepared that they should walk therein, and enjoy and manifest all holy and heavenly tempers, even the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. But does not this preaching this faith lead men into pride? We answer accidentally, it may. Therefore ought every believer to be earnestly cautioned in the words of of that great apostle, because of unbelief, the first branches were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. If God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in this goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And while he continues therein, he will remember those words of St. Paul for seeing and answering this very objection. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. If a man were justified by his works, he would have whereof to glory. But there is no glorying for him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. To the same effect are the words both preceding and following the text. God, who is rich in mercy, even when we are, were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, that he might show the ex exceeding riches 
of his grace and the kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Of yourselves comes, cometh neither your faith nor your salvation. It is a gift of God, the free undeserved gift, the faith through which ye are saved, as well as the salvation which he of his own good pleasure, his mere favor, annexes thereto. That ye believe is one instance of his grace, that believing ye are saved is another, not of works, lest any man should boast. For all our works, all our righteousness, which were before our believing, merited nothing of God but condemnation. So far were they from deserving faith, which therefore, whenever given, is not of works. Neither is salvation of the works we do when we believe. For it is then God that works in us. And therefore he that giveth us, us a reward for what he himself worketh only commendeth the riches of his mercy, but leaveth us nothing whereof to glory. However, may not the speaking thus of the mercy of God as saving or justifying freely by faith only encourage men in sin? Indeed it may and will. Many will continue in sin that grace may abound, but their blood is upon their own head. The goodness of God ought to lead them to repentance, and so it will those who are sincere of heart. When they know there is yet forgiveness with them, with him, they will cry aloud that he would blot out their sins also through faith which is in Jesus. And if they earnestly cry and faint not, if they seek him in all the means he hath appointed, if they refuse to be comforted till he come, he will come and not, will not tarry. And he can do much work in a short time. Many are the examples in the Acts of the Apostles of God's working this faith in men's hearts, even like lightning falling from heaven. So in the same hour that Paul and Silas began to preach, the jailer repented, believed, and was baptized, as were 3,000 by St. Peter on the day of Pentecost, who all repented and believed at his first preaching. And blessed be God, there are now many living proofs that he is still mighty to save. Yet to the same truth, placed in another view, a quite contrary objection is made. If a man cannot be saved by all that he can do, this will drive men to despair. True to despair of being saved by their own works, their own merits or righteousness. And so it ought, for none can trust in the merits of Christ till he has utterly renounced his own. He that goeth about to establish his own righteousness cannot receive the righteousness of God. The righteousness which is of faith cannot be given him while he trusteth in that which is of the law. But this, it is said, is an uncomfortable doctrine. The devil spoke like himself, that is, without either truth or shame, when he dared to suggest to men that it is such. It is the only comfortable one. It is, the very, it is very full of comfort to all of the self-destroyed, self-condemned sinners, that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, that the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Here is comfort, high as heaven, stronger than death. What? Mercy for all? For Zacchaeus, a public robber? For Mary Magdalene, a common harlot? Methinks I hear when say, then I, even I, may hope for mercy, and so thou mayest, thou afflicted one, whom none hath comforted. God will not cast out thy prayer. Nay, perhaps he may say the next hour, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven thee, so forgiven that they shall reign over thee no more. Yea, and that the Holy Spirit shall bear witness with thy spirit that thou art a child of God. O glad tidings, tidings of great joy, which are sent unto all people. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, come ye and buy, without money and without price. Whatsoever your sins be, though red like crimson, though more than the hairs of your head, return ye unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon you, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. When no more objections occur, then we are simply told that salvation by faith only ought not to be preached as the first doctrine, or at least not to be preached at all. But what saith the Holy Ghost? Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, even Jesus Christ. So then, that whosoever believeth on him shall be saved is and must be the foundation of all our preaching. That is, must be preached first. Well, but not to all. To whom then are we not to preach it? Whom shall we accept? The poor? Nay, they have a, particular, a peculiar right to have the gospel preached unto them. The unlearned? No, God hath revealed these things unto unlearned and ignorant men from the beginning. The young, by no means, suffer these in any wise to come unto Christ, and forbid them not. The sinners, least of all, he came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Why then, if any, are we to accept the rich, the learned, the the reputable, the moral men? And it is true, they too often accept themselves from hearing. And yet we must speak the words of our Lord, for thus the tenor of our commission runs, Go and preach the gospel to every creature. If any man rested or or any part of it to his destruction, he must bear his own burden. 
But still, as the Lord liveth, whatsoever the Lord saith unto us, that we will speak. At this time, more especially, will we speak that by grace are you saved through faith, because never was the maintaining this doctrine more seasonable than it is at this day. Nothing but this can effectually prevent the increase of the Romish delusion among us. It is endless to attack one by one all the errors of that church, but salvation by faith strikes at the root, and all fall at once where this is established. It was, the doc- it was this doctrine, which our church justly calls the strong rock and foundation of the Christian religion, that first drove popery out of these kingdoms, and it is this alone that can keep it out. Nothing but this can give a check to that immorality which hath overspread the land as a flood. Can you empty the great deep drop by drop? Then you may reform us by dissuasiveness, a dissuasives from particular vices. But let the righteousness which is of God by faith be brought in, and so shall his proud ways be, be stayed. Nothing but this can stop the mouths of those who glory in their shame and openly deny the Lord that bought them. They can talk as sublimely of the law as he that hath written by God in his heart. To hear them speak on this head might incline one to think that they were not far from the kingdom of God, but take them out of the law into the gospel. Begin with the righteousness of faith, with Christ, the end of the law to every one that believeth, and those who but now appeared almost, if not altogether, Christians, stand confessed the sons of perdition, as far from life and salvation, God be merciful to them, as the depth of hell from the height of heaven. For this reason the adversary so rages whenever salvation by faith is declared to the world. For this reason did he stir up earth and hell to destroy those who preached it, who first preached it. And for the same reason, knowing that faith alone could overturn the foundations of his kingdom, did he call forth all his forces and employ all his arts of lies and calumny to affright Martin Luther from reviving it. Nor can we wonder thereat, for, as that man of God observes, how would it enrage a proud strong man armed to be stopped and set at naught by a little child coming against him with a reed in his hand? Especially when he knew that little child would surely overthrow him and tread him underfoot. Even so, Lord Jesus... Thus hath thy strength ever been ever made perfect in weakness. Go forth then, thou little child that believest in him, and his right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Though thou be as helpless and weak as an infant of days, the strong man shall not be able to stand before thee. Thou shalt prevail over him and subdue him and overthrow him and trample him under thy feet. Thou shalt march on under the great captain of thy salvation, conquering and to conquer until all thine enemies are destroyed and death is swallowed up in victory. Now thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom with the Father and the Holy Ghost be blessing and a glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might forever and ever. Amen.